Hello and welcome to another Alter Your Health episode, another Medicinal Monday episode of the Alter Your Health podcast, I should say. I'm Dr. Benjamin Alter. And I'm Dr. Susanna Alter. And we are both naturopathic doctors who support you in optimizing your health through whole food, plant-based nutrition, as well as mind-body empowerment. Uh, so today we're talking all about high-fat diets and if you've been following along with whole food plant-based eating, you probably know that it is naturally a low-fat diet, um, quote unquote. And that whole fat conversation tends to really confuse people because let's face it, high fat diets are still very trendy. And they have been, you know, in, in various forms for many, many years. Um, so in our conversation today, Dr. Suzanne and I hope to kind of clarify the risks associated with these high fat diets. And really, I think what we'll mostly be talking about are the longer term risks, because let's face it, you can lose weight and have changes in your biomarkers for a short period of time doing a number of things, maybe including eating lots of fats and omitting or running away from or strictly reducing the number of quote unquote carbohydrates that you're consuming. But what are the risks with that way of eating? Because let's face it, I, I, a high fat diet is just another way of saying a oh, low carb diet. Yeah. And I'm really glad that this is the topic this week that the plant-based and stress-free community chose because even though we talk so much about the benefits of whole food plant-based eating in our group and these Medicinal Mondays on our podcast, I think that still a lot of people are faced with uh, those challenging conversations where someone says, oh, you're doing plant-based. Well, you know, I did that and I gained this weight, but on keto, I've lost all this weight and uh, low carbs, the way to go, high fats, the way to go. And, you know, there's still, there's just so much conflicting information out there. Oh, yeah. So it's just another opportunity for us to really set things straight here when we're talking about really the long-term risks of these high fat diets. Yeah. And with anything, you know, we really drive home all the time, at least I try to, the fact that carbohydrates and proteins and fats are not food groups, right? These are macronutrients that are present in all whole foods. Um, but that being said, you could say that fats can be like a food group and like oils, for example, are fats. They are pure, 100% pure fat. It doesn't matter if it's extra virgin olive oil or coconut oil or uh, lard, which I guess is lard's not oil, but it's hundred percent pure fat from animals. Right. Um, so in any case, when we're talking about eating we're, and we're, when we're talking about whole food, plant-based eating, well, we're talking about getting all of the experience from whole plant food. Um, so it's kind of impossible uh, to, 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 a, to eat a, a high fat diet while eating a whole food plant based diet because plants inherently have all these macronutrients combined carbohydrates as well as proteins and fats of course we know that it's clear um, and most most plants are carbohydrate rich they're also rich in fiber they're also rich in proteins they're also rich in fatty acids they're also rich in vitamins they're also rich in minerals and other phytonutrients but all plants in their whole intact form have carbohydrates. That's what makes them plants. That's those carbohydrates come through the process of photosynthesis, a process that all plants undergo. Thank you, nature, right? Um, but when we're talking about animal foods, animal products, they are devoid of carbohydrates, making them predominantly protein and fat, right? So when we're talking about meat, fish, dairy, and eggs, it's really a conversation of how much protein versus how much fat? Is it a lean meat, quote unquote, that's lower in fat and higher in protein? Or is it a fatty steak that's higher in fat and lower in protein? Is it marbleized or is it whole milk, uh, whole fat milk? Is it cream? Is it butter that's much higher in fat? And butter is, of course, pure fat. Um, or is it lower in fat? Is it 2%, 1%? You know, is it skim milk? Um, in any case, 
animal products, just some composition of fatty acids and amino acids or proteins. No carbohydrates, with the exception, of course, of the dairy products that have the lactose, which is a carbohydrate that I think 90% of Americans are quote unquote intolerant to. They don't have the enzymes to digest efficiently lactose. Um, nope, nothing wrong with those humans. Just means that they're not baby cows, right? We're not designed to digest lactose. Um, but in any case, yeah, that's kind of tweezing apart the macronutrient conversation. So of course, back to the back to square one, like whole food plant based eating is naturally lower in fat and higher in carbohydrates. So when we're talking about high fat diets, just to maybe define them more so, we're really not talking about whole food plant based eating, and that's okay. We're talking more about um, you know paleo sort of thing or keto sort of sort of thing or any other once again, low carb sort of thing, which is going to, if you're not eating carbs, you're just eating fat and protein. And then it's just a matter of how much fat versus protein keto being, you know, mostly fat and just a little bit of protein and then carnivore, I don't know, more, more protein versus compared to fat. I don't know. And then Atkins, I think was like higher protein and, and fat, but like, you know, higher protein than the keto. Yeah. What I'd also like to add um, into the high fat diet category is also just the standard American diet, mm -hmm. which still has quite a bit of, you know, processed carbohydrates in it. But, you know, a lot of people who are, are kind of just not being mindful of what they're eating in a standard American diet, they might still definitely eat an excess of fat as well. Yeah. So I'd put that in the category as well. There's risks for continuing on that kind of lifestyle. Yeah. And even standard American diets, like most of those people are probably told that they're eating too many carbs. And um, I listen to nutrition conversations all the time. Um, one one conversation that I just can't stand that I hear, uh, to be frank, I hear from Joe Rogan a lot, you know, like the guy, but he's giving a lot of nutritional recommendation that is just simply not science based. And also it's not true. Um, like for example, he, he often says, I've heard him say it like a couple times in different contexts, you know, whenever I eat carbohydrates, I just get sleepy. And then he'll give the example of sushi. Um, he was like, yeah, I'll go out to eat sushi, you know, all that rice, man. It just makes me sleepy. And I'm just like, dude, what is with your rice? It's, it's, it's raw fish. That's fat and protein. It's like that. Yeah. There are carbohydrates in that meal, but it's not a high carbohydrate meal. Maybe it's high carbohydrate for him. That assumes a low carbohydrate diet, but for a whole food plant-based eater, uh, sushi would be a high fat meal, a high protein meal, definitely mm -hmm. for me. Um, so anyways, it's, it's just helpful to he hear all of this in context and really know what we're talking about when we use these terms, high fat, high protein, um, is now to the, the risks associated with high fat eating, which again, just kind of implies that we're eating more animal products and processed foods. Yeah, I guess we'll go through the organ systems here, right? Because sure, I don't know how you wanted to do it. I mean, high fat diets do pose a risk to several different organs in the body. And so, well, the Where first do you want to start, which let's start the... since you since you brought it up, let's start with the gallbladder. Oh, I, yeah. I brought it up before we came on the air because I was just curious because we've talked with a lot of people who are talking about having their gallbladder removed. Maybe it's something they've you know said that they should do or they've done it. And I was like, man, a lot of people have had this operation. And I just was curious. And we learned that 500,000 people, half a million people every year have their gallbladder removed. And the reason why that would need to happen is none other than uh, chronic consumption of high fat foods. Yeah. And that, that those stats are of Americans, only Americans. So 500,000 Americans every year have their gallbladders removed. Yeah. I'm sure we all know someone who's had their gallbladder removed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, when we learned the risk factors for, uh, you know, cholecystitis, gallbladder issues that would require removal, we, we learn a little acronym, um, you know, and 
the the five fours and oh, yeah. i don't know if it's politically correct anymore it's okay but uh well you know let's that just, is one of them that is one of them uh over female. the age of 40 is one of them female because there is a higher rate of gallbladder issues in women now what's the fourth four fourth f um why, you, why did you bring this up when you didn't even know it oh, no. <laughs> I sure, sure as heck didn't know. I just Maybe remember. Maybe a fiberless diet. No, I know that's not it. Anyway, <laughs> someone can share with Google and share with us the other F risk factor for cholecystitis. Right. But that fat, oh, yeah. you know, represents a high fat diet and also carrying more fat on the body. Mm. But the high fat diet is the main piece, is really the main piece there. Um, so why is that? Well, the gallbladder is responsible for secreting bile, which is necessary for digesting fat. And if the gallbladder is called upon secreting more and more bile more and more often, then what happens is a lot of activity happens in there and then more got more bile is being produced and then it's not being used and then it's being produced and then it's getting sludgy and staying in there and there's not enough blood flow and we're not using enough other digestive enzymes and that sludgy gallbladder becomes um, stones. And then those bile stones can get lodged in the cystic duct that leads into the small intestines. And that's a really bad thing that can lead to an infection inflamed gallbladder. And the treatment of that for that is getting the gallbladder removed. It's just that simple. You go in there and have to cut it out. And people do live just fine and dandy without a gallbladder. But what that means is their liver is responsible for taking on the storage capacity of the bile as well as the production of the bile. And most people's liver are, is already taxed enough given our current state of affairs on planet earth. Um, so more real estate needs to be shunted for that task. Uh, it's, it's just not necessary. And then, you know, it's just, it's just more reason, however, to be more mindful of dietary fat. And the best way that I know to be mindful of dietary fat is simply to eat a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah. Yeah. So we can also talk since we just talked about the gallbladder about how it affects the liver, um, you know, yeah. because those two organs work hand in hand. And when we do eat more dietary fat, um, it does call upon more energy from the liver to produce bile. And um, you know, so the liver has a huge role in metabolizing fat in that way. Also, we also see that when we eat an excess uh, of especially saturated fat, it actually puts a strain on our cholesterol metabolism. That's another role that the liver is responsible for. Um, when people eat more saturated fat, they have higher cholesterol levels in the bloodstream. And, you know, I don't know if we have enough time to go into the, the whole liver um, cholesterol conversation here, but um, when your liver becomes backed up and, and kind of sluggish, then one of the results is that it might not not be able to balance our cholesterol levels as efficiently it won't be able to break down the circulating cholesterol as efficiently yeah etc so we think about high fat diets as just being an added strain on the liver for that reason so when we're it either whether whether we're talking about cholesterol metabolism and excretion uh, or detoxification of course encompasses lots of things um, a high fat diet puts a strain on these processes so a way to combat that, a way to support healthy cholesterol metabolism, a way to support healthy hormone balancing, a way to support healthy natural detoxification pathways is again, being mindful of dietary fat. Yeah, and so many people now have incidentally found that their liver might be fatty, fatty. non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there is misinformation going out there about, oh, well, the cause of fatty liver disease is actually consuming too much fructose. So you have to cut out the soda and cut out the pastries. And yes, you should cut out the soda and the pastries. But what is the bigger factor that's contributing to fatty liver disease is the excess consumption of dietary fat. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, a lot of this fructose studies are looking at fructose in the context of high fructose corn syrup. And most people who are consuming high fructose corn syrup are not washing down their salads and their baked potatoes and their beans with Coca-Cola and Mountain Dew. They're <laughs> washing down their, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers and chili cheese fries and French fries and whatever with, with Coca-Cola and Mountain Dew and whatever other high fructose corn syrup sweetened drinks or what, whatnot. Yes.
So yes. liver and gallbladder. Um, Heart? Well, I think about the uh, lymphatic system was coming to mind mm -hmm. because it the lymphatic system is directly related to the processing of fats as well. Um, when we eat fats, when um, fats are transported in our body, um, well, it, it's actually kind of complicated. And I guess we should go through the process of fat digestion. Um, fats are broken down into individual fatty acids and absorbed into the intestines and then make their way into the blood, wait, make their way into the lymphatic system, not the bloodstream. Everything else goes into the lymph, the bloodstream, but fatty acids go into the lymphatic system and these big molecules called chylomicrons. And that those chylomicrons, those fatty acids circulate through the lymphatic system and enter the circulation via the thoracic duct, which is kind of in our neck right here, but below our subclavian, into our subclavian vein. Um, anyway, when we're eating high fat diets, our lymphatic system can get really sluggish. That term again, um, when it, when it's filled with these chylomicrons, these triglycerides that are that are bound onto the chylomicron molecules, um, and of course, a sluggish lymphatic system, a stagnant lymphatic system, can have huge impacts on our immune activity, our detoxification pathways, and. Gosh, it's kind of, it's like, I've heard some people talk about the lymphatic system as like the sewer system of the human body. And it's like when the sewage gets backed up, things kind of stink, you know, and that those symptoms can manifest in so many ways through the interconnectedness of the lymphatic system with the liver and the circulatory system. Um, so good way to keep your lymphatic system is, of course, eating a diet that's naturally low in fat and also moving the body since the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump, we need to use our muscles and walk and bounce and jump and dance and uh, move our lymphatic system in those ways. Um, so that's huge as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, related to the lymphatic system, we can talk about our circulatory system, our arteries and veins that carry the blood throughout our body. And eating high fat diets also create sluggishness in this pathway, in this circulatory system. And we can see that because, you know, having a high amount of fatty acids in the bloodstream will thicken the blood, make it more viscous. Having higher cholesterol levels will also make it more thick and viscous. Mm -hmm. And when you have that higher viscosity, that is what creates more arterial damage, which is really the first step of the process of forming plaques in the artery. And of course, we know that as plaques form and get bigger, then they can break off, they can cause a stroke or a heart or a or, heart attack. Or simply impede blood flow and lead to suboptimal circulation. Um, but certainly cardiovascular disease and plaque formation is uh, hugely, uh, you know, due to the presence of hyperlipidemia fats in the blood. Of course, cholesterol are uh, <laughs> they, we're we're kind of trying to bring so many yeah. subtopics together here. <laughs> we really are. But cholesterol um, are are essentially lipoproteins that are once the fat makes its way into the blood. Uh, so high li lipids in the blood, high fats in the blood, is of course a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. Um, yeah. So we went through those things. I would, you know, the other thing that was on my mind in the beginning was the digestive system, the risk mm. of on the digestive mm -hmm. system itself um, from high fat diets. Um, and we know that fat digestion creates a level of endotoxemia, um, which is like, you know, bacterial endotoxins are emitted and perpetuate in the digestive system and wreak havoc on our microbiome. Um, when we're consuming high amounts of dietary fat. And that, of course, will have acute and chronic effects on our digestive health. Uh, not to mention the fact that high fat diets are just inherently going to be, again, low in carbohydrates, low in fibers that are necessary to feed our digestive gut bugs as well. And high fat diets, we talked about, they require bile to um, to break down the fatty acids, but also, um, you know, assuming high fat diets are also going to be high, relatively high in protein, unless we're drinking oil and stuff like that, um, then then we're also going to be 
calling upon other pancreatic enzymes to break down the proteins as well as other lipases, uh, you know, lipid dissolving uh, enzymes that are necessary. And essentially, high fat, high protein diets are just so much more demanding on the digestive system. And there's a lot more work that needs to happen to break down these molecules as com compared with, um, you know, the carbohydrate rich foods that are naturally whole plant foods. And are feeding our microbiome. Yeah. With those good sources of fiber. Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to slip in here real quickly. Uh, one more organ. And then I think we should end on metabolism. Yeah. Um, but this I'm going to slip in the, the topic of just kidney health, the risks of high fat. Oh, diets I want to slip kidney. in one more after oh, okay. kidneys. But yeah. Well, you know, the truth is the majority of the high fat diets out there are high animal products diets, right? Meat, dairy, eggs. I mean, I guess you could be eating a, a keto vegan diet and, and perhaps a, a, a vegan keto diet wouldn't have as much. Um, In order to do that, you'd be drinking oil yeah, and, uh, and eating leafy greens, I guess. Well, perhaps you could argue that a vegan keto diet wouldn't be as harsh on the kidneys, but certainly the high fat diets that do include animal products are really hard on the kidneys because they are extremely acidifying for the kidneys. A lot of the amino acids in animal protein, um, they contain sulfur and they actually, in, in the process of them being broken down, are converted into sulfuric acid, which is really hard for the kidneys to excrete, um, you know, long term. This is what leads to kidney disease. And yeah. that's why uh, the way to reverse kidney disease is to eat a low protein diet. Um, so, yeah, high fat diets usually mean also mm. high protein is the point. Yes, it, we made that conclusion in the beginning. And yeah, kidneys, a lot of people have kidney. And then there's a circulatory issue related to kidney issues because of all the fine microvasculature of the kidneys, which leads me to the last thing is the brain, you know, yeah. because a lot of people associate high fat diets with brain health. And why that association is made is really beyond me. A lot of people say, oh, well, the brain is mostly fat, so we should pour some fat in the brain. And that's like, I don't know, probably not the smartest thing to do because the brain is mostly fat, but brain cells are just like any other cells in the body that preferentially metabolize carbohydrates as fuel. As fuel. In fact, they, they uh, use, what is it, 80%, 20%, I don't know. A, a lot large of percentage. a lot of energy is utilized by the small mass. Not I'm not picking on your brain size, but the relatively small mass of the brain uses a, a proportionally, proportionally a more energy. large amount of energy. Um, anyway, high fat diets in the brain. Well, it all comes down to the circulatory system. Circulation in our brain is immensely important. All of those little precious little neurons require an abundance of blood flow. And if you were to dig into the brain and look at all of the microvasculature supporting the health of the brain cells, it's flabbergasting. There's so many blood vessels in that brain. The sluggishness of our uh, blood flows black, back to arterial placking of our vascular system back to our vascular health conversation and how high fat diets impede optimal blood circulation, optimal arterial health, optimal blood viscosity, um, then that can have significant effects, especially in the long term when we're talking about brain health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, dementia is a lot, of, a lot of people use the term, it's kind of like type three diabetes, which leads us to metabolism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, but I wanted to say one thing, one more thing about the brain being fat. Like, yes, the brain is predominantly fat, but the the fat in the brain is predominantly in the myelin sheath around the neurons, and the myelin sheath is kind of the insulative, uh, conducting, uh, like uh, conducting the neurons and conducting the action potential flowing through those neurons. So the the insulative insulative capacity of the brain does require fat, but we have no shortage of fat in and on our bodies, uh, you know, and the brain has no shortage of fat either. Uh, we're always consuming fats from our 
foods that we're eating in whole plant, you know, when we're on a whole food plant-based diet and those fats, assuming that they're uh, optimized omega-3 fatty acids, they're going to make their way into the proper places of our body and serve the functions that we need. So no one's got a fat deficiency that I know of. Do you have a fat deficiency? Let me know. (laughs) And then we will end on the discussion of cellular metabolism. And this is connected to the discussion of also insulin sensitivity of the cells. So anyone who has blood sugar issues, this is we're talking to you. And so um, the real risk of a high fat diet is that it causes insulin resistance at the cellular level. And what that means is that when we consume a lot of fat, especially saturated fat, that fat, some amount of it gets stored inside of the cell. And when that cell is uh, filled, when, well, I'm, I, what I want to say is when the fat is stored inside the cell, it interferes with insulin signaling pathway, which really is what allows the gate to open to let glucose into the cell. Right. So in a nutshell, the high fat diet is directly causative to insulin resistance, which is the underlying cause of type two diabetes, but also a compounding cause of type one and type 1.5 diabetes. And also so closely uh, connected with just a sluggish quote unquote metabolism, weight gain, uh, again, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, cancer, a lot of disease processes have to do with insulin resistance. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, which again is due to the, I guess we didn't throw out the term, the technical term of intramyocellular lipotoxicity, the toxicity within the cells, predominantly the muscle cells of the body, but also the liver cells, um, interfering with this normal insulin signaling mechanism. Whew, we All crammed right. a lot in. I think we did. And and, and hopefully I, we uh we made our we made our case. We made our case. High fat <laughs> the high fat diets come with risks. So we should be be weighing the risks and the benefits. What are the benefits? I don't know. They maybe they taste good. Not to me. I think plants in their natural form taste better. Mm-hmm. Um, but we what, don't we don't also we don't have to be afraid of fat. Of course not. No, no, no. We're not talking about a zero fat diet. That's impossible, right? Yeah. Um, Unless we're, you know, just drinking soda all day. But (laughs) um, but yeah, whole food plant based diets got the right amount of fat in it. It does. (laughs) And just to uh, define what that right amount is, quote unquote, uh, what we find when we observe someone who's eating a well balanced whole food plant based diet is their carbohydrate consumption. We we don't track macros, macros personally, but it's kind of a just where we land. Um, Carbohydrate consumption tends to be around 70 to 80% carbohydrates. Protein consumption tends to be around 10 to 15% protein. And fat consumption, therefore, tends to be around 10 to 15% fatty acids as well. That's just where we naturally land. Um, We also didn't cover the fact that when we're talking about whole food, plant-based, quote unquote, fats, Uh, We use the term overt fats, the the plants that their primary macronutrient is fat. And those are, of course, nuts and seeds and avocados and cacao or chocolate and coconut and that's and olives. And we like to say that those foods should be eaten in moderation. Those are yellow light foods that are whole plant foods. All the other foods that are whole plant foods are green light foods. And those yellow light foods eaten in moderation should more or less fit in about the palm of your hand. Give or take, depending on the day, depending on how you feel. Don't be stressed and worried about it. But just focus on the carbohydrate rich foods that fill you up and power your cells. All right, everyone. Well, we did it. And uh, we have no announcements this week. Well, maybe just keep your eyes peeled for the next upcoming Whole Food Plant-Based Challenge. We have not figured out the dates or the topic yet, so we'll be surveying the group. Um, But also, we do have our next Alter Health Cleanse right around the corner. That'll be happening in October. Whoa. So October's around the corner? Isn't that crazy? All right. Well, (laughs) I guess that means we should go live our lives. All right. (laughs) Peace and love, you guys. Thanks for hanging out for another medicinal. Monday. We'll see you guys next time. Bye for now.